Hello everybody and welcome to Handmade Hero, a show we code a complete game live on stream. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we verified sort of last weekend that we'd finished up our apron stuff and we added some nice code to the world generator to just make it easier to place uh, entities correctly and use essentially a tile grid for creating stuff when we want it to, to do that. Uh, obviously our engine doesn't really require tiles uh, at all. Um, our engine is completely freeform, but the sort of the play of the game uh, is supposed to be fairly tile-based a lot of the time. And while we may relax those constraints for certain circumstances, we want the ability to think about things in terms of tiles uh, in order to create sort of the uh, Zelda-esque or Binding of Isaac-esque kind of feel of a lot of the rooms um, and dungeons where you're supposed to kind of have this understanding of, of, of tiles. And so, uh, and, and really honestly, our game is even more that way because we're sort of like which tile you're standing on is actually really important to our game. And so it's, it's even more than those two games important that the player understands the tile nature of most rooms. And again, we can relax those uh, in the future. We may want to kind of make it so that there's different fixed locations that are not really in a tile grid, but you still like stand on specific points because the game's more about standing on specific points than it is about tiles. In other words, it's about being able to know that there are certain exact numbers of locations in the room you can stand and which one you're on. That's important, but that they are in a grid is not important to the gameplay. It's just the easiest way for us to create most of the things uh, that the player experiences because it's something players can understand very easily and visually process very quickly. Um, if you provide some kind of chaotic set of points the player can stand on, then one of the big problems that you have is choosing which point you're moving to from any given point becomes perhaps a little bit more exercise in frustration where it's like you were trying to move to one and you actually move to another, that sort of thing. Whereas a grid, all joysticks are set up to be pretty clean to press. If you only have to choose one of four directions, you know, a D-pad will do that really nicely. Um, even an analog stick usually works quite nicely for doing that sort of thing. And so I'm, uh, and obviously the arrow keys, WASD uh, and stuff are, are perfect for that as well. So, it, you know, most of the time we want to stick to things that kind of look like a grid or at least can, can be processed like a grid. Uh, and so we were able to get all of that stuff working. I believe we are, you know, clear now to do sort of the next, whatever the next uh, uh, sort of larger thing is that we want to do. And so what I want to do today is talk about uh, sort of the next sweep through the game because we, we want to start making some bigger changes here. Uh, and we'll just sort of talk about those. I mentioned them briefly last weekend, sort of what the options are, but we're going to we'll have to pick uh, a big thing to do today and, and go from there. Um, so if you take a look at the current state uh, of the game, you can see the stuff that we added uh, last, last week is these aprons. As we pull out here, you can see uh, how we've sort of created an external area around where the player is. This looks smaller than here. It's actually not. If That's just because it's not paged in. So if you see as I move the viewable region over, you can see that it paged in uh, more of it. So it's always at the moment an eight wide apron uh, that we just sort of hard-coded to that number, but we can change that number. We don't really know exactly what we want it to be, uh, so we can just always adjust it as necessary. But anyway, that apron now exists everywhere in the world that rooms don't, on the top floor, which is at least something we wanted. And we could add them to any other floor. It's pretty freeform the way the system works. Uh, and so we kind of now have an, uh, the ability to control all of that, and that's good. Uh, so now that we have that taken care of, that sort of uh, ability to add stuff externally, uh, I want to kind of tackle uh, the rest of the world solidity issues that we have, right? And so the two world solidity issues that we have at the moment that I'd like to, to tackle are, first of all, we've got the lighting. We have to finish the lighting. That's going to be a major undertaking that'll take several weeks. Uh, because that's got to go from being kind of like a okay little system we worked out to being something that's industrial strength. Like right now you can see it only operates on a very small area. That's largely just due to performance issues. We haven't 
addressed uh, how we're going to make it more efficient, right? And so we have to take that system and make it into something that can just run on the whole visible area all the time uh, and be nice and fast. And we have to produce more usable results. Right now, we really are only tracing panels. Uh, and the consequence of that is we don't really have any way to sample the lighting uh, for our sprites. Uh, it would be pretty easy for us to run sprites through a lighting pass, but right now we can't do so uh, because we just don't have information available for that, right? Um, and so we need to deal with the lighting. And the other thing I would like to do, uh, again, for world solidity purposes, is I would like to go ahead and get ground cover in there. So when you look outside, um, when we go into the forest areas or into those aprons, one thing you can see is there's nothing on those tiles. The idea was that we would have sort of grasses and stuff in areas that are supposed to be external like these. We would not simply have a tile that was, you know, uh, a green wash. We actually wanted to have some little like, you know, flowers and grass uh, fronds and stuff like that that we would sort of stack in there and so that it would make it a little, uh, you know, more clear uh, what was, you know, sort of just to give it more character, right? Uh, and so that's the other thing that we want to do. And the thing uh, about these two world solidity things, I think once we have that, uh, there's maybe one more thing we would want to do, which is to start putting, you know, trees and stuff out into the apron which is pretty simple. We, we already have the ability to place trees, so it'd just be a, a matter of running some kind of a simple process to scatter them uh, around out here. In fact, you know, we could just do that right now and have that be done, uh, so maybe we'll do that. But point being, ground cover is a major thing and lighting is a major thing, both of which we have to address. And then once we've got that done, I feel like at that point... <clears throat> we have sort of gotten to the to the level where uh it's fairly uh flush right it's it's like i don't think there's anything else we need in terms of world solidity it would feel like um you're playing a game and not like a prototype right uh and that's really where i'd like to be on that so you know getting to the point where when you just look at things they're solid and again, like I said, a lot we've got a lot of that, right? Uh, most of the things in here look like they're solid now. Uh, like the camera motion looks solid and the <clears throat> uh, sort of the way that we're focusing on things makes it look like it's a world. There's not obvious empty parts anymore. Uh, all of the stuff looks stable and clean. There's no crispy edges or anything. So I feel like we've done a good job with, with the world solidity. And so it's really just the lighting and ground cover of the two things. That I think remain. Uh, so I'm going to go add the trees today. I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. But then I think we want to start on, on those two issues. And I'm actually, as opposed to tackling them separately, I think they actually are sort of um, part of one single update in a weird way. And the reason that I say that is right now we haven't really done the work in our entity systems um, to properly deal with dynamic versus uh, persistent state, or I should say transient versus persistent state. What I mean by that is that even right now, the lighting information that's cached from frame to frame, that lighting information is cached forever. So for example, if you look at what happens, uh, if I zoom out here and I move around, you see how the lighting region follows me right? That lighting region is computing lighting for all of the entities that are inside that, that sort of rectangular, it's actually a, 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 a right rectangular prism. It extends downward as well. So it's, it's actually uh, not flat, but you get the idea. Uh, so what's happening with the lighting when it's getting computed there is that that area is storing lighting information into those entities. It's actually cached from frame to frame, and that's necessary for <clears throat> for pretty much any advanced lighting algorithm. You need to store results from frame to frame because if you don't store results from frame to frame, uh, you end up in a situation where you can't smooth out the noise inherent in something as complicated as, as lighting sampling. 
And so we need to store that information, but right now it's literally stored forever. So as I leave, uh, it's getting stored. Like these entities out here are still storing that lighting information for no real reason, because we could just start recomputing it as we get closer to them. So we, at the, and then at the very least, these things out here that got paged out, like the entities aren't even in the simulation region anymore. <clears throat> even those entities are storing the lighting information. So at the very least, we only really want lighting information for things in the simulation region, but probably we only need it for things in the visible region, or at least a, like a small apron around the visible region, wherever we want our lighting startup to be, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so if you think about how this interacts with ground cover, what's going to happen with ground cover is sort of the same thing. I really don't want to store the information about how all the grass is placed on each individual entity forever because I only really need to know it when I can see it, right? When I'm in here, I need to know the grass placement for every entity that's on the screen, but as soon as I move up, right, and, I, and this room fades out of view, I don't need to know where the grass is on it anymore, right? I can recompute that once I come back here as long as I have a way to regenerate the sequence of grass placement. Uh, for any given tile, I can just recompute it when it comes into view. So again, <clears throat> the same exact thing is going on. We sort of have this idea that there's probably information we want to use and store. In fact, it may be information we even want to store on the graphics card, right? We may want that information to be persistent <clears throat> in a way that the graphics card is actually able to just retain uh, all of the point information uh, that's relevant to it, right? so that we don't have to send it down every frame. So even that piece of information is another good, uh, a good example of, of, uh, of, of why this information needs to be managed more carefully. And so what I'm getting at with this extremely long-winded explanation is that what we need to attack both problems is a new understanding of entity state that gets persisted during its lifetime on the screen or nearby uh, and then that gets thrown away in the case where we uh, are sort of paging it out and so our world system gives us a very convenient way to do this our world system itself understands this concept very well it has a uh, it already has the ability to look up things by chunk, entities are stored in chunks, and those chunks get unpacked into the simulation region already, right? That's something that we already do. And so all we would really need to be doing in this case is we just need some way <clears throat> of having that world system store complete data. So all the lighting information, all the ground cover information gets pushed into the world system but instead of the world system treating that information as permanent and writing it back into the world chunks where the information is stored uh, for the entire length of the game, what we can do instead is hold it in a effectively like a level two cache, if you will. Uh, that then, if you ask for it again, you'll get it back. But if you constantly are pushing information into there, right? And when you pull it out, we mark it as being like recently used. When you eventually try to push in too much, more than the total storage that we've allocated for that level two cache, we just purge whatever the least recently used thing was and reuse that space for the new information, right? And so putting it into a cache in this way would allow us to do exactly what we want. Only store this information for uh, things that are actually being used in the visual set uh, or that have been recently used in the visual set and purge those things that aren't. <clears throat> we can also tie this system to GPU information updates such that if we would like, we can actually store things uh, or rather allocate space on the GPU for things like lighting information and grass information based on whether or not the thing is in the L2 cache of the world, right? The W2 cache. <laughs> um, so 
that's really what we're looking to do here. And so that's why I say these two updates are really kind of um, closely coupled because they both need effectively the same sort of thing. And I think we can uh, sort of kill two birds with one stone, at least in terms of the structural implications of what we need to do. Uh, and the fact that the lighting will require sort of uh, a different set of work that has more to do uh, with improving the algorithm we're using uh, doesn't really change the fact that it can still benefit from this idea that certain pieces of information are stored in sort of a second uh, level uh, of cache inside the world. So let's start out just for a warm up. Let's start out with something easier. Uh, let's go into the, the world generation system and just add those trees. Uh, you know, as we're sort of doing this generate apron, um, I'm just going to do a really stupid version where we place a tree down there. Uh, you can see in here, we've got a situation where we add one of these trees. Uh, I'm going to pull that out just because, uh, you know, there's no reason to, to write the same code twice. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say uh, place tree or, uh, you know, maybe like uh, add tree or something. So we're not really placing it. We already know where it is. Uh, and so if we look here, when we get into this uh, place, here is the information that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to do is this add obstacle here where we're actually placing a thing. Um, I don't know. I have to go look and make sure that the add obstacle call uh, doesn't do anything else. But we probably don't quite want this in both cases. We probably want one thing that will add an obstacle in one case and another when we're just placing a generic tree uh, can probably do some kind of a generic add entity call. So we're going to look at that in a second and we'll see. But basically what we're going to do is have this add tree call do something here, right? And it'll do all this. Uh, so to start with, we can probably do something where uh, add obstacle would work. And again, maybe, maybe we just really need these in here. So, you know, maybe this is add tree tags or something like that. Uh, and all you have to do is, is send this down, right? So you could say like, okay, here's the world generator uh, and here's the entity. Uh, and then later on, we can customize this function by having uh, parameters that we send down so that these things aren't random anymore. They're, you know, actually geared towards whatever's in that area. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this procedure. Uh, if we want to add a tree in this code where we're sort of iterating over these tiles, uh, what I can do is say, all right, you know, if some condition is true, that's a random pick for now, but maybe would be m more interesting later. Uh, we're going to add the tree tags to some kind of a tree here. In order to create an entity, I could just make one uh, like so. I don't know uh, that there's anything I have to really do to it other than make sure that it's placed in the right location. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward as well. Uh, I don't really remember what the ground point rules are uh, for this. So we'll take a look in a second uh, for those. But we should actually have, in fact, get min z center p. We really just need to get max z center p here probably. Uh, I don't really remember again exactly how this code uh, wants to work. But I think that's just the bottom point of the tile. And so what we want to do here is just move that up. So in fact, if we look at how this is actually working and we set this collision volume here, um, this volume where we do this get volume from min z and we pass the height, right? Uh, that gives us the exact offset, I believe. Right, so if this volume is relative to this location, uh, then we should be able to add this location to the maximum point of the volume and get uh, the place where you would stand, right? I mean, that I believe that's true anyway. So if we sort of said here there was like a ground P, um, and I said something like, uh, in fact, I could, well, I guess I don't see any obvious way to do this using this because this thing doesn't know how big that tile wants to be. Uh, but if I was to say get max um, corner like so, 
where we get the maximum for this volume. Uh, and you know, I could even say, get min z center p. Uh, so this actually, we, we could make an equivalent to this. which is just that, uh, and that would actually give us exactly what we want, right? So all we have to do now is just say whatever the, the location is uh, of this thing, we know that we made it relative, so let's just use the get max c center p for this volume and then we're, we're done, right? And so if we're gonna place the entity on that ground p, we should be able to just you know do it like this. Again, I don't know if that's the right placement because I guess we haven't really done much work on figuring out how to create entity placement points. But I believe that our convention so far has been to take the point that's on the ground uh, where the entity is and treat that as the entity location. So I'm gonna keep that for now. All right, uh, and so what I'll do here is I'll just place a tree on everything for starters uh, and we'll go from there. I think this is all we really actually need to do um, to make this work. I don't know why I call that entity instead of tree. I think that's probably all we need to do because again, these entities don't do anything. They're just an inanimate object. Uh, so I don't think we need to call anything else um, for them. Uh, and we'll see. Although the fact that I see no trees is not a good sign since there were supposed to be trees everywhere and now there isn't. What happened? What did I do wrong? Um, Oh, uh, I know what I did wrong. I did it. I literally did exactly what, wait, why isn't, where, why isn't that call found? Where's that add obstacle call? I literally said I was gonna look at it and I didn't. What is add, why is add obstacle not something that's been marked as a function? What's going on there? Oh, it's just one of these genetic callbacks, that's why. All right, so what happens here is we didn't add any pieces of scenery to it. And so we kind of do need a thing that does uh, this part of the call. So adding the tree is sort of an actual thing we do need to do here, right? And this occupying part where we pass, you know, it gets the standing on bit. I assume we could just pass null for that if we wanted to. Um, so I feel like that's probably fine. Now, unfortunately, like I said, I don't know uh, that we really want to though because we don't really need the colliding flag. It doesn't need to p participate in collisions at all Although, you know, I mean, maybe we could argue that it should I don't really know uh, But so if we actually look in here, let's just say that uh, this add piece call um, And all you know, we, we want all of this stuff uh, Yeah, see see this placement wouldn't work because it, it's just a standing on point point wouldn't work all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna basically pull the common part of this out, uh, which is like we've got that add optical. I'm gonna have like an add uh, inanimate, um, and we're just gonna have this stuff here that would normally be there. Uh, this doesn't need to be there. This doesn't need to be here, but these do. Something like that. And so when you do an add inanimate, and I do want to return this as well. It'll do just this part. Um, similarly, we could, in fact, this part here would work as well. So we could have it so that you say add an animate and you say where you want it to be. Uh, I don't know that we need anything else from there other than the region. So I think it's just this, right? And so if we were to do this call, all we would have to do is say, hey, when you actually do one of these, Call add inanimate first uh, with the sim region and the location you wanted the thing to be. And of course, we do know the, the location where you wanted the thing to be. It's this, right? Um, so we'll do that. And then this extra stuff here that you wanted to do, well, you can do that as well um, for the adding the obstacle part. But at least now we've got the ability to do an add inanimate uh, that, you know, is a callback for that, right? 
And so let's go ahead and say that that's correct. We may want to make this a create entity call as well and chain create entity to take something else besides those. But you know, for now, I'm not going to actually do that. Uh, so now we can actually call this. And I think that will solve the problem we're having where we didn't assign any image to it. So there were trees everywhere, but we couldn't see them. Uh, so what we'd like to do now is just say, yeah, let's fix that, right? So make this. Uh, we want all this thing to create the tree, set it up, add the tags, etc. Uh, everything should be good. Um, redefinition of formal parameter p. Let me go back to that code. So the problem there is that when we are saying, uh, you know, this part right here, uh, I guess it gets past a p value as well. I'm going to look for the gen create entity spec. Uh, I just want to see what that looks like. So it looks like it's the, it's got a traversable reference here and a P value that's being passed. What's interesting is I don't know that that P value is ever getting used. Uh, so it's a little bit odd. Like if you look at what's going on here, you can see, uh, the p value gets used in one case, but the standing on gets used in other cases. That seems a little janky to me, and I would imagine that we really need this to be. Um, we probably really we need that to be more robust uh, than that. Just just looking at it, so you know my assumption is probably what should happen is like when we do these things, uh, instead of them getting the, instead of calling this code, we should probably just add the p-value directly in here. In other words, we should probably do something like this. Uh, you'll have to forgive me for skipping uh, through these. Uh, I just wanted to um, take a look. So yeah, you can see here how we're kind of doing that. Yeah. So what we want here, you can see that there's there's sort of two general flavors for how this is called. One is I want to place an entity on this point. The other is I want to place an entity kind of, um, what's what I'm looking for? I want to place it onto something it's supposed to be standing on like this, right? So you get the you get this call. And you only need one or the other, right? Um, in fact, you can see in this case, it's kind of doing it the wrong way. It's using the entity p equals p when it shouldn't be. Uh, because it's supposed to get a standing on instead, you know, and so on. So I think we want to kind of solidify that part. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, introduce two ways of calling sort of these functions, right? Uh, and so if you're using like the, the gen entity thing, you've got this gen entity creator bit here. So what I want to do is something maybe like this. We've got uh, one version, which it's going to look like this. Uh, that's going to be like, you know, uh, gen entity at P. Uh, and then we're going to have another one that's like gen entity uh, at traversable. And so you can have two ways of calling it. And depending on which way you call it, you'll get a different uh, way of doing things, right? So in here, we'll call the creator function. <clears throat> Uh, for whatever it is that we're doing, we'll pass the sim region, so you need to tell us that. And then in this case, you'll pass the p, uh, and in this case, you'll pass the traversable reference, right? Uh, and in either case, once we move my head out of the way, uh, in either case, we will call that function, but in one case, uh, we'll use the p value directly, uh, and in the other case, we will use the p value indirectly. Make sense? And in both cases, <clears throat> um, we'll return the result. Uh, but in one case, such as this one, we also have a little bit of additional work we need to do there. All right? So hopefully this makes sense what I'm talking about. It's just basically allowing you to use this in either way. So the occupying part needs to come in here. Uh, and the get some space traversable part needs to come in here. 
but then I think we're good to go, right? Uh, looks like we call this standing on. And so uh, I think that's all correct. Looks good to me. Uh, and so now this stuff doesn't need to happen anymore. So entity P can just be the P value. What we could also do is actually looking at these, I feel like it's just wasted code anyway. Uh, and so one might argue that that can even be abstracted out more, um, or rather uh, pulled out to a higher level, right? So if I literally get rid of the even the entity P part in its entirely, in its entirety, uh, right, that just looks like this. And so that code can now be used in two different ways, uh, depending on what's going on. And the functions that actually implement this no longer have to concern themselves with what their location is. So when we look at something like add obstacle, this goes away, right? This goes away. That goes away. All of this stuff just gets simplified, right? <clears throat> what else we got? All right. Again, just deleting the code that's no longer necessary. I think all of this stuff is fine. Uh, that's result, not entity. Probably should have called it entity. Don't know why I didn't. Um, and I think that's it, right? And so now people just need to call the appropriate one, whichever one it is that you actually wanted. Uh, and then you can go from there, right? So in here where we're calling add obstacle or here where we're calling pen pending entity creator, instead of doing that, right, what we're going to do is we're gonna call gen entity, uh, oops, entity at uh, traversable and we're gonna pass the grid region, we're gonna pass the creator function, and we're gonna pass that ground reference point, right? Uh, this is not necessary anymore, because it's already automatically found for us, um, so that's good. And now we're gonna do the same thing uh, in anywhere else that we see it. So here's our add obstacle call. Uh, and again, add obstacle now, we're just gonna use add obstacle as, uh, as a creator function. So rather than calling it directly, we're gonna pass it again. So this is gen entity at traversable. Uh, we again, pass that grid region, the add obstacle call, uh, and the reference point on the ground. Same would be true here. Uh, and off we go. So now we have the flexibility of having functions that are you know, passed to us, but that we can call in multiple ways. And so now when we're in our tree code here, this finally leaves us at a point where we're in good shape. Um, what we can do is say, look, instead of uh, calling something like an add inanimate here, we'll actually make this be uh, a gen entity at p call. Uh, we'll pass the grid region, and then we'll have that inanimate here. Uh, and we'll pass the ground P as it stands. Uh, that allows us to go up here, take that add inanimate call, turn it into one of these, uh, and oops, and now we're good to go. Also, why is the gen create entity call, gen create entity call, uh, these should be marked internal. Uh, there's no, they're not supposed to get exported, so that's, that's just an oversight there when we were um, creating that code. Okay, so I think now we've got a situation where everything is flowing a little bit more nicely through that line of code. Uh, and again, yeah, it gives us the ability to call it two different ways, which, which we want. Uh, if we run it now, we should have a forest of trees, uh, quote unquote, which is just garbage right now, right? It's just randomly picking. Um, but there you go, right? And so those areas are completely filled with trees. Now, just to sh make sure, you know, we're in the realm of, of reasonable here, this is gonna wanna be some distribution function at some point. Um, and so we should be able to do something like a random choice here. Uh, and we look at the, uh, 
uh, the series that we're using here. Uh, we want to take that random choice, you know, one in every third tile, I don't know, uh, is a tree, let's say. Um, and so that would just make it so that it's clear that we're actually placing them kind of randomly. Yeah. Uh, again, not a good distribution function for trees, but at least it proves to us that it's working uh, and does what we want it to do, right? Uh, and I think that's pretty good. Let's also sort of have a, a maybe if we wanted to do our tree tags a little bit differently here. So inside the tree tags, you can see here we're doing sort of random unilaterals for these things where we've got different kind of um, uh, tree tags. For now, since we don't want it to look so ridiculous, um, maybe we would like to just say, look, uh, let's, let's keep uh, dark energy and fall and stuff out of it. In fact, I guess, you know, I could do this a little bit differently and say, um, maybe these are, are going to be set to zero for now, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe that just looks a little bit more consistent for us at the moment, um, and so off we go. And, you know, mostly what that highlights too, uh, which is good, is just that, uh, well, and you know what else we could do now that we're at it too? Um, I feel like we could also look to see if there was a, anything close to it um, and not put trees there. That would be an interesting thing to try as well. So for example, um, in here where we say like, okay, we're gonna generate the apron. So we're looking to see whether or not overlapping entities exist uh, in this, you know, in, the, in this particular area here where we do a, a get total volume. What we could do instead is just say, you know what, um, let's do that same thing here. Uh, I guess for the tree, well, of course it would find other things, so we'd have to be more specific. I'm just thinking like, where do, where do we wanna, what if we wanted to do things that are like, always going to be a little bit further away from the room. So we don't place trees like right next to rooms or something like that. Um, eh, I'm not going to do that yet. Because I'm going to say like once I start thinking about that, I'm like, that kind of gets into things that we want to do a little bit later with, with distribution. So I'm going to leave it like this. Uh, anyway, what I was going to say is what you can really notice here too is again for the world, uh, from the standpoint of world solidity, you can see why it's so important to light the sprites, right? We're not lighting our sprites right now, and as a result, this area out here should be dark, um, but it's very obviously not. Like, only the ground tiles are being dark darkened, uh, whereas the actual trees are br completely bright. Uh, and so that really breaks any of the illusion there of the trees. Also, we have the trees sort of poking through... Um, poking through the um, walls here, which actually I don't know that I really want to fix because I, I don't think we should ever put trees in. Look, trees are supposed to be kind of overly large. And so I think we want to solve that mostly with world gen. We don't want trees that are placed next to walls because they kind of occupy more than their tile. That's just how the trees sort of work. You can see they extend kind of out uh, too big. So I, I would say that that's really a bug that has to be solved more with world pl uh, placement. Um, and not with uh, <clears throat> uh, and not with changing the way the Z stuff works. Uh, so yeah, I think we're all good there. Um, we should be we should be fine going forward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and take the add tree tags and do what I said I wanted to do, which is sort of unify those two code paths as well. Uh, so in here, I'm just going to say let's take the uh, tree tags. And this way, those will both be going through the same path. That will mean that now we only have like the wintry trees. Oh, grod. That's good. What's a grod? I feel like a grod is something that we should know what it is. <clears throat> uh, all right. 
so now we should have just those trees. Um, and let's see if we do. Oops. Probably ran it too soon, huh? So we're still getting some of those and some of these. What's going on there? I thought I changed it to, oh, nope, I didn't. Aha. Okay. So now I think we're good to go and to move on to the next part of our, uh, <clears throat> next part of our um, adventure here, right? So we should now only have the wintry trees because everyone's going through that add tags call. Uh, and so it shouldn't be picking any fall trees anymore uh, or dead trees or dark trees, whatever they're called. Uh, so just looking at, at what's going on here. Also, what is, what's going on? What is, What's happening right there? There's like a tree that's like placed sort of underground or something. Do you see that? Like what, what's happening there? Why are we getting a second tree placed sort of That's a bit of a puzzler. Uh, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we really have uh, much of a way to figure out where that's coming from. Um, Hmm. So that's, yeah, that's kind of one of those things where I'm like, I don't really know, uh, we don't have a real way of picking where that, we, we almost need better debug information to figure out where that's coming from. Because we don't really know who would be responsible for drawing that. What's, what's more interesting is, it seems to be, that that occurs on every bottom left tile. So you can see like it's at the, it's like we're, we're adding one tree at the root location of every room. I don't know about every room, but many rooms. In fact, let's go see if that's true. So it's like there's one tree being placed at zero, zero, zero right so who is placing one tree at zero 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 and to be fair it might not be one tree it could be lots of trees being placed at zero 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 right So I'm gonna start by doing something pretty basic. I'm going to get rid of this piece of code um, and see whether or not it gets rid of the errant tree placement, just so I know who is placing it, because there's only a few places we call entity generation. So we should be able to see, okay. So first thing we know is it ain't that code, right? Because there they are. Um, so we know it's not this code. Uh, I'm also gonna do a little thing that I like to do sometimes, uh, which is just like, make sure that I can find this again. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so now what I wanna do is go find out, you know, is it, who, who else is calling something that could be placing 
uh, those trees in, in a bad way, right? Uh, and so let's suppose that it's this call. Let's just ice that out. Uh, and so again, one by one, I'm gonna remove calls that can create entities until I know who is responsible. So it's still there. So it's somebody who's not creating a tree at all. It's somebody who's just creating something, right? Um, so again, let's take a look uh, and see if we can broaden the set of things being removed. Again, just removing some entities from the mix. And so it looks like if we're not doing land, well, no, 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 no. Right? So we're still creating something at the sort of base of the room. Uh, so let's keep going. So now I think we have removed any hint of the problem. So I'm sus what I'm suspecting is maybe there was actually just a bug in this general code path that now, like, because for example, if I go to gen entity at traversable now, I'm assuming that if I make this a, like, is anyone calling it now? Yeah, so I'm assuming this just generally has a bug. Oh, and in fact, I'm looking right at it. Uh, so that's it. We were just accidentally left a secondary call in there, right? Oops. So let's go ahead and remove these. I think that's all there was. Just a little typo there. No biggie. Uh, and now I think we're good. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, so that was all there was. I think I don't think there's any other problems with that. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so now we want to get started on the next process, uh, which again is just to, to give us the ability to sort of have um, a secondary level of storage where we know that there are some things that are there for visual continuity uh, and efficiency, which either it's information we cannot regenerate in any predictable way. That would be something like the lighting where it's not like a function we just call and we get back the lighting. It's actually just a stochastic process that we hope converges to a reasonable result. So it's something like that, that we literally cannot just recreate. So we want to store it because it needs to be averaged over time. Or something that the ground cover, maybe it's something that actually uh, could be recreated at any time directly, um, but it's just too expensive to do so. Meaning, um, and in certain, some states, those are both kind of the same because you could argue that the lighting is recreatable. We just run the algorithm long enough and it converges to the, to the lighting. Uh, and so that, you know, answers the question right there. But <clears throat> assuming that we're going to treat it as just, these things are too expensive. So we need to cache them at least a little bit. Uh, those pieces of information need a place to live, but they don't want to live forever. Uh, and so the first thing that I guess what I'll do <clears throat> uh, to start us off is let's go ahead and put a basic ground cover system in there. Uh, let's get it working with permanent storage. And then we'll have, we have both the lighting and the ground cover <clears throat> are both in there. 
Uh, we'll see how inefficient it is because it could be it should be quite inefficient. And in fact, with ground cover, it'll be even more inefficient. We probably don't want to send it down every frame because it's not changing every frame. Uh, so it will basically give us a good layout to see how we want to start moving forward with that secondary level of caching in the world system. All right. Um, so how this would work, right, in the fully most worse and most expensive way to do it is, again, we've got this sort of super bloated entity struct that we haven't really cared about much, um, and now we're going to start caring about it a little bit more. And you can see here how we've got this lighting point state nonsense is in here. Um, and you can see here, like, we've got sort of, uh, you know, a to-do already talking about the secondary level of caching. So what we want to do here is have the notion that there's ground cover as well, right? It's part of the process. Uh, and just looking at that, what we need to do for ground cover is pretty straightforward. Uh, if we said that there was some kind of ground cover here, we just need two pieces of information. We need like a location for the ground cover uh, and we need like what we're going to draw. Right, so we need to know at least that information. But if we're honest, we probably need a little bit more, right? We probably want to do some kind of a color variant here, right? Um, so maybe we want a color that we would multiply in, uh, you know, like a tint basically, so that we could vary the colors a little bit as necessary. And then we probably also want one more thing, which is we may want a scale. So we may want to like, you know, sort of change the size of some of the grasses just again probably not huge but maybe between like 0.9 and point one and you know 0.9 and 1.1 which is not quite a uniform on either side but you get the idea so that we can kind of have uh, a uh, a nice you know clean way of of ver uh, you know varying the, the bitmaps a little bit even if they're the same bitmap they can get sort of played with so thinking that through, um, this is basically the information we want for splatting down those, uh, those ground covers. And when we put those in there, we kind of need a known way of doing fins on them. But we can, since the ground cover shouldn't be very high, we can probably just use a known method of finning them, uh, which will not require the extensive calculation that we currently do to place sprites properly so that they don't intersect uh, the ground plane. <clears throat> we should be able to literally just put grass in there um, in a pretty straightforward fashion that's, that's not particularly uh, interesting to anybody. So if we're going to do that, we really just need this piece of information, right? And off we go. Now, one thing that's true about this is there's not a lot of reason that it has to be attached to an entity. So this ground cover could be kind of arbitrary, but I think there is an argument, even though it creates a little bit of inefficiency for us, I think there is an argument to be made that these things should be attached to entities. The reason that I think there's a, an argument to be made there is because if these things are attached to entities, they can be manipulated uh, when necessary. So for example, if the ground cover were not attached to an entity at all, then we would get in a situation where if something was supposed to happen, like something was supposed to catch on fire or an entity was supposed to go away or was supposed to like raise or lower, um, the ground cover wouldn't move with it, right? And so I feel like we do need our ground cover to at least be related to the entity somehow if not stored with it. But I think it probably needs to be stored with it um, in order to, to work properly, right? And so if we take the ground cover and we say, all right, there's gonna be an array of ground cover that exists in here, right? We would have something like this. And you can already see why this is going to start being a problem. This is a lot of information. And if we were to put as many of these in as we probably want, uh, which is probably a fairly high number, right? That just really bloats out the entity structure even more. And so now an entity structure is just huge. And even just the time we spend uh, copying that around is now gonna be probably an issue. 
So I don't know if we'll see a, a speed uh, hit here. Uh, you know, computers are so darn fast that, you know, it's kind of nuts that we don't see an immediate kind of obvious speed hit from that. Um, but, you know, it, it probably still is uh, at least a little bit, um, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest, you can kind of look at the pro profile, you can see it really just doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> computers, man. Uh Intel and AMD really ship some amazing stuff. Uh, you got to hand it to them. Uh, we do our best to, to ruin it here in the world of software, um, but it's just kind of nuts when you look at how flat this profile is. It's like if we just, when we improve our lighting, our frame time goes down to basically nothing, right? Even though it's so piggy, right? It's, it's horrible, and there's so much we could do to improve it. Um, it's kind of nuts how amazing CPUs are. They just eat it for breakfast, you know? Uh, and it's just, it's kind of crazy how, how good they are at that. It's really, you got to hand it to them. Uh, they, they do such amazing work. Anyway, uh, so if we take a look at something like compute light propagation here, which is just taking up all of our time. Uh, and again, you know, we can sort of see that here's like a huge chunk all of our time is getting spent uh, doing that. Uh, we would reduce our frame rate by, gosh, what, probably two thirds. Um, so, you know, if we look at this here, this this is what's sort of unfortunate. This is a little bit misleading because this is gonna get counted because of how many threads are doing it. And so when you look at this number, it's not, 87% of the frame time, probably. It's more like 66% of the frame time or something. Um, and you kind of got to look at this to see what would... Because you're not saying how much CPU time was spent doing it. You're asking how much CPU time... Um, how much frame time would be saved. And so the CPU time is uneven. These things are not parallelized that are happening in here, right? And so even if we free up all the CPU time, it wouldn't get used uh, by the other threads that are, that are sitting around idle, right? And so that's just, you know, a reality of, of having to look at the profile with a more uh, careful eye, but you get the idea. All right, so looking in here uh, at this entity, you can sort of see how that blows things out. Uh, and it doesn't really cause a time problem for us, but you know we could also see whether how, to what extent it creates uh, a space problem for us. One thing that we don't have right now, like when I run the game, right, we can't see how much space is taken up by our world database, but I feel like we could. Uh, and so, like if we looked inside uh, handmadeworld.cpp, uh, when this actually gets run in here, we've got some information we could use, right? In fact, if you look, we've got a memory reading here uh, that tells us what we're using for world storage, right? Uh, and so what we could do if we wanted to uh, is we could take this, um, this world arena and just say how much memory it's actually using. So if I look at, you know, the memory arena uh, and we, I don't know, do we have a function that just says how much space is getting used? So we don't actually have, um, we don't actually have a immediate call that gives us the total amount used um but it would be pretty easy to find right because you could use the the current block information for that and i think that would give you what you want so let me see here So this debug platform memory stats, right? We can get that information. Um, and 
and we probably just should print that out. The, the only thing is, you know, that's just for the total memory use. And so actually, you know, it doesn't really tell us what we want. We want to know how much is uh, allocated to our world's arena. So I think what we really want is something that would tell us that information, right? And so like when we run, um, when we bring up like the profile or whatever, uh, you can look here and you can see like how much memory is being used in how many blocks, right? Uh, and so you can kind of see that like we've got, all right, it's using half a gigabyte uh, of memory right now. But of course, a lot of what's being used for that half of a gigabyte there is in the debug information. In fact, this may only be the debug information, right? That's all of our just recording everything that happened on every frame. And that's why it stops getting used. I don't, so I don't know whether that's actually the whole game or just the debug information. Uh, but point being, it really just doesn't tell us any information, um, right? We, 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 none of our debug views here have anything like this, right? Uh, and so what we'd like to do is get sort of something that would tell us more specifically what uh, is going on with our memory there so that we could have uh, an idea of how much uh, space we're saving, right? Uh, or using for any particular, uh, for any particular arena. And, you know, if you looked at, at sort of, you know, in here, we could sort of have those arenas labeled as well. Uh, might be another kind of nice thing about that so that the arenas themselves could maybe um, update the debug system periodically with what the actual size is. Uh, and I don't know, you know, how we necessarily would want to do that, but I do think that would be relatively straightforward. Um, for example, yeah, I mean, if each time through we just said like, hey, or, or even if we just had our memory arenas iteratable uh, in some sort of global way, that would probably work. Um, I'm not sure, I, I just don't know if I really want to do that right now. It's something we should probably put on the horizon though. <sighs> Let's just take a look, let's take a quick look. Um, so in here where we've got sort of these editor, these various editor calls, right? And then we've got sort of our debug system and this whole thing didn't really come together as well as you know we would have liked because it just takes a long time to build these systems and we never really zeroed in on it. So it's still a little bit sprawling and a little bit um, kind of hacky. You can see here like we've kind of got this uh, um, two phase kind of thing where we've got our debug stuff. In fact, there's a memory a dev mode memory right there that, that doesn't actually do anything at the moment. Um, in, in fact, do we ever actually, uh, oops. We actually have an F8 key that maps to a dev mode memory, but we don't actually do anything. And you can see here, like we call those. So, uh, it just doesn't do anything when you actually push the F8 key, right? Um, so I'm not sure exactly how that was supposed to work in the grand scheme of things, uh, but let's take a look at, at uh, maybe where does dev mode rendering actually get set? Um, So I assume that this call needs to get called and just isn't getting called at the moment. Um, so like, that. Um, and so I guess uh, you can see that we sort of had a, a sort of loose plan in place here where we were going to say, look, let's go ahead and have these memory arenas um, do something useful here. 
and we just never actually did anything, right? So it may be the case that we can put these into, um, we can press these into service somehow. Uh, for example, I don't know if I can, really know how this works. But maybe we can do something like this, where in the world system, uh, you know, when we come through here and we create one of these worlds, maybe we can announce that to the system. I'm not really sure, again, to what extent this would actually work, but uh, you can see that it just, it, I guess it just uses whatever that parent arena is here. Um, so when we do a create world in that case, uh, pretty much just happens right there, looks like. Um, so in here where we call this with the mode arena, uh, we want that mode arena to be captured because that's the one that would uh, show us what's going on. And you can see in here that the mode arena itself uh, is just, you know, game state mode arena. And so in theory, we should be able to, I guess I don't need to put that in its own area. I guess that could actually happen here as well. So we could just do something like, you know, uh, oh, never mind. There it is. So never mind. I guess we do have that. We don't have the asset arena here, um, but that could also, I suppose, be uh, placed in there as well because it's just assets arena, right? So we could put So that asset arena, um, I actually don't know if that's what that's called, but I believe that's a separate arena that we use only for this um, particular purpose. So called non-restored memory. And now the question would be, if we take a look at these arenas inside the debug system, like what can we print out that would be useful, right? At the moment, I really only care about one thing, which is I would like uh, for these arenas here to have some kind of a total space, right? Um, and so like going into the debug system, uh, like just looking for where that gets uh, actually used. So we've got this straw arena occupancy stuff and Again, don't really know like what our plan was here, or what we were doing. And so, you know, it looks to me too like this part yeah it doesn't really make a lot of sense so it looks like we're basically looking at things that were tracked to the arena but i don't think these actually ever get stored do they i mean maybe they do
but did we like did we actually put a debug marker in here for when we push a size on here because I sure don't see one right so I feel like that probably doesn't actually do anything um, but yet we had something in here so I'm not sure what this was doing to go back to our own video archive and see. Um, so I guess what this was doing previously is it looks like it was just accessing the actual direct arena structure and then drawing some kind of a, a rectangle to just show how much was used or something like this, right? So ideally what you would have here is not that, right? You would have something that sort of said, uh, who is responsible for allocating each block, right? And so, And so there's a couple different ways we can do that, and I'm not really sure which one we want to do, but um, yeah, but I think at least from my perspective, I think this is kind of going at it a little bit the wrong way, right? So what you want to do here is every time you do an allocation, you want to record like who did the allocation so you can see who's using the memory, right? And so in a sense, I would say that really these should just be things that are underneath the arena and we just print out those sizes and we could do them as a graph if we want to but we probably just want to know those sizes. I like there's something to be said for showing the allocation pattern, but that allocation pattern would definitely be something that's a little bit harder uh, to track. It certainly requires more bookkeeping to do so. So I don't know. The other thing that's a little bit janky here is if you look at how this is working, when you do draw arena occupancy, you're gonna need to know, like like in this case, we're actually getting the arena itself. And while that might work, I don't know how well it works. It wouldn't work like over time, right? So we're not storing that information um, sort of persistently. Which maybe is okay. But again, it's just one of those things where it's like, I, I think that if I had to criticize the approach to how I was doing the um, debug system is it's just too generic. And I think it doesn't really accomplish much as a result uh, because it's just very, very uh, arbitrary and generic. It doesn't have like the tools that you actually need for doing specific kinds of debug viewing. And so I think just too much time was wasted on that sort of stuff and that you can kind of see that uh, fragility coming through because it should be pretty easy, right? Uh, if you had just purpose built a little thing that tracks the allocations, that's not a very hard thing to accomplish. Um, but because it, everything tries to go through like a uniform event system that doesn't really know what the heck it's doing, um, there's not a lot of ways you can really... Uh, You, there's not a lot of ways you can really deal with memory allocations because those are things that um, aren't viewing an event. You're viewing the state of the allocator at any given time, which cannot be recreated only from events unless you had all the events from the very beginning of time and ran through them all. So you kind of need a list of the results of the events, right? Uh, and yeah, you know, I just don't necessarily see that being something that's easy to do here. So I think what I would want to do is I would want to build something that's 
uh, a little bit more purpose built and allows us to show the actual, uh, allows us to keep the actual set of allocations that we had, right? And so if you look at how the memory arena works at the moment, um, oops. <clears throat> Uh, what you can see is that for every memory arena, you've got one of these current blocks here, right? Uh, and the current block is the thing that that platform memory block. <clears throat> uh, that platform memory block is the thing that we actually use to uh, push things on. So like we've got the flags, the size, the base, the used. We use this use parameter to kind of like move things along as we go. And so it seems to me like what we probably want here is something where we could do, like just imagine for a moment. Uh, what you kind of want to do is say, look, whenever we do a push size call, right, we have the information that we actually need uh, to do what we want to do uh, in that push size call. So if you look at everywhere that we were doing uh, any kind of push calls, so uh, like for example, all of our main ones here, uh, I don't know what optional clear parameter is because we have an optional clear parameter which says don't clear. So is that, I don't think that to do is valid anymore. Um, if you look at these, it's pretty easy for us to say, at least in these, when we do pushes in here, it would be pretty easy to say, look, the push size call <clears throat> is going to do a thing where if we're in sort of our handmade uh, internal version, uh, we're going to take a file and line uh, number in there, right? So we're going to say, here's the file. Uh, here's the line number. And if we're in handmade internal, where we're saying that this is an internal build, that stuff's gonna get passed down, right? And so uh, I would assume the easiest way to deal with that is to go, oh, well, and I suppose, now that I think about it, I suppose we could do it at the end which might make things a little easier. <clears throat> Excuse me, well, I guess it wouldn't. Um, so when we're doing these here, right, we can sort of have two sets. <clears throat> like so. Uh, and essentially what we're gonna do here is just pass the file in line. And so when you come in here and you get a file name and a line number, now you know uh, you can actually do, and actually don't ask me why I put those in the opposite order. I don't have a reason. Um, now we just have to make sure that everyone who calls push size uh, actually obeys that rule. Um, so you can see in here, there's some people who call that directly. Those are the other calls inside the memory system, it looks like for the most part. Uh, which will fix this stuff will if zero out for now. <clears throat> uh, and so looking at these, <clears throat> excuse me, what we need to do here is make sure that these also do that uh, exact same thing. So we want push string Z to actually call push string Z like this, right? So effectively uh, push string Z there's a macro that would just take the file in line from whoever was calling it uh, and make that work like so. And again, same thing. So this is actually that, and this um, is something that would get up here in the, you know, just, just like the rest of them that would, that would use sort of an internal function to do the work that it's going to do. Um, however, when it's not in internal mode, it won't pass those. It's just a pass through and that's it, right? Okay, uh, so now 
push string z can just have a pass through file and line number so exactly the same way uh, as it was doing here and again this is just all horrible it's horrible because c++ is a horrible language um, and designed by by uh, simpletons right and so you know we've got to do all this garbage for no real reason it's just a waste of our time uh, but that's just how it goes what we can do here is we could make this be something that's a little bit cleaner so we could make this like uh, internal memory pass through right um, and then what you could do is say look each one of those starts with that uh, so then we do like you know internal memory pass through is this nonsense right uh, otherwise it's nothing that way when you come through in each case we don't have to write the routine every to have those pass throughs every time maybe this um, so this way we can say like look everything has to start with that garbage uh, and then everything has to pass that garbage right uh, and that way it's not you know um, it's not something that has to have so many pound ifs through the whole thing it can just be one sort of sort of thing that's d uh, determined by this central system um, and then everyone can use it it's still not great uh, but it's you know better than nothing I guess is the way I would put it uh, and then you just define them to nothing in the non uh, internal build version right so I think that's probably good enough and here you know we can use the same thing for the push size function itself right to get rid of that uh, and off we go so again it's not fabulous but it's, it's the best we're going to be able to do probably uh, all right, so if we put this in here and say uh, that we want to do all of these the same way, um, because really we sort of do, like we want these to all have that same tracking so that we know uh, what came from where. We, so we probably want like all of these to have that information, just looking at it, right? Uh, and so if we were going to do that, it's, again, pretty straightforward. All of these get one of these, which, again, is not the worst thing in the world now that I've done that pound define. Uh, so all of those get one of these, and then all of these get the pass version. Right? Uh, And these push copy calls, they need the ability to take those uh, parameters themselves. In this case here, where we do a push buffer, I guess this wants to clear. So I, I guess we're literally doing this. Um, so, th you know, this was defaulting to clear. Why this doesn't take a parameter, I don't know, because you would think that you would want to. Um, like this. Uh, in fact, I'm really not sure why these all don't take that. But the idea would be, you know, this this should always have the params there, uh, so that you could override the ones where you when you call push buffer, like what did you want to do, right? Um, and and I really don't know. So if you look at push string z versus push string here. Uh, I'm going to have to go out and a limb and say I don't understand why we have both of these functions. Uh, am I missing something? Well, I guess that one needs to be null terminated and this one doesn't. That's about it, right? I, mean, I, don't, I don't really see much else. Um, so we probably want these to, again, also be uh, macros in that same way, uh, if that makes sense, so that they can do, when they do their push copy, uh, you know, we can do something more like this. And so that would really be the only thing there. Um, 
nothing else really needs to happen there. Uh, and the rest of these work properly. So these guys are underscored, and then we need push, you know, both of them, push buffer and push string. Sort of both need to have, uh, and, and I'm sorry, and also push and null terminate. Those all need to be uh, macroed, right? Now, in order to make push copy work properly, we actually need two sort of versions of that. We need one uh, that that puts the file and line number in for you, and one that doesn't. Now, the one that doesn't do that uh, should, you know, we should be able to reuse the same one by just having this take the file and line number. So basically, like, you know, this would be file and line like that. And it would actually do it like this. Um, and then this push copy would just be a call to the existing push copy uh, that went like that. Right? Um, and so we'd only have one actual push copy and the other one would be this. Uh, so if we looked at, at that, and we wanted to sort of make this work this way, um, we would just say, okay, in the version that's not internal, when we do the push copy, uh, we still have both things, but now they just don't actually do that file and line pass through anymore. You know what I'm saying? For the rest of these, it's literally just a thunk. So, you know, the, in the same way that we had our push string Z do this um, and do nothing in the other case, we would do the same thing for our other functions. So we'd have a push string, do the same thing. We'd have a push buffer, which does the same thing. Uh, and we'd have a uh, push and null terminate, uh, which does the same thing. So all of those are just, you know, straightforward wrappers. Um, and then here we would have the exact same set of straightforward wrappers. So we would have push string, push buffer, and push and null terminate. Uh, and those would literally just thunk through to their underscored version without actually changing the parameters. And again, that's strictly a concession for allowing that stuff to th flow through uh, unadulterated in the other case. Uh, so now we kind of got to fix all this stuff. Um, looking at how, for example, push copy here is working, um, not enough parameters for function like macro application. So we got to actually go make sure all this stuff is correct. Um, that's supposed to pass the file name and line number uh, to push copy, which it's supposed to do. Uh, <clears throat> But it looks like it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it looks like it's the right number of things because there'd be the file name, the line number, so I messed up something there but I'm not really sure what because <clears throat> it's supposed to take one, two, three, four, five parameters, and we're passing one, two, three, four, five parameters, <clears throat> which seems like exactly what we want, you know? Uh, so I'm not sure why it's thinking that's bad, because it sure seems correct, but Obviously, it doesn't think so. So why doesn't it think so? <clears throat> Not enough arguments. It also thinks there's a missing this isn't a return, right? Yeah. 
So, yeah, what is the problem here that this is complaining about? Because I don't really see... <clears throat> I don't really see any issues with that. Um, I'm gonna just double check. So something about internal memory pass is not working. Right? Because I replaced it with two things here and it didn't generate an error. Of course, file and line shouldn't necessarily work in there. <laughs> so what just happened? I'm very confused right now. Like why didn't that give me an error? But obviously internal memory passes is, is an issue here. Internal memory param is apparently not uh, but I, again, don't know why. So, <clears throat> I'm at a bit of a loss there, uh, and I would like to see what it's pre-processing that to so I could know uh, what's what it thinks is wrong. One thing I could do as well is just make sure that these are getting used. Let me just go ahead and put some errors in there. Yeah. So that's getting used. And that's getting used. <clears throat> so it is, as far as I can tell, actually doing, you know, putting in two things there. And yet, let's see if this is true. Hello. Five. If I actually uh, replace these with something else, I'm, I'm wondering if there was a, some other bug and and that, that there just doesn't seem to be. Um, so I really just don't understand I really just don't understand what's going on there. I wonder if this is a problem that placing that inside its own macro ins expansion is creating a problem where it's actually using that that as a parameter instead of expanding it. I guess uh, is what's happening there. So I suppose there's a smarter way I could do this, right? Uh, I could always have these take the file name and line number because uh, it works for anything where I'm calling an actual function but if I'm not calling an actual function you get the problem is there a way I could make push copy you know not be that and if I look at it it does look that way because if you take a look at what happens inside a push copy it looks like it just kind of works to a certain extent right so maybe if I just make push copy into its own function instead of doing it the way I was doing it, uh, maybe that's sufficient. So like, for example, we can leave it like that. <clears throat> and then here we can just create a push copy. And that way I wouldn't be in that zone of macro expansion death. Um, I'm not sure. We'll find out. So if, if we actually had a push copy, um, and we did it like this. And uh, I went ahead and grabbed the same, like I said, same sort of procedure here where you're just sort of telling it, you know, what you wanted to do. Uh, then in theory, you know, this could just work. So we do the push copy and you do this in, you know, this piece of information here. What's also nice about that is you could get back a pointer to it if you wanted to. So like there'd be a result now, which there wasn't before, which is kind of nice. Um, so I feel like maybe that's just better all around. And it also solves the problem that we were having uh, with, that, with that call in general, right? Uh, and so, yeah, I like that a lot more. And then that way, now we don't have this function at all. Like it's just the macro. 
Um, and furthermore, I guess that means we can do this, right? And so it, it means that all of these are now just doing that one stripping or adding activity, which seems like way better, right? Um, So I think that's I think that's more solid, and I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, okay, so let's take a look here. So in order to make these work, we now need those to be actual parameters. Uh, that should be pretty easy because uh, the size is just a memory index, um, or a UMM as we call it now, uh, and this is just a void star. That's like where you wanted to copy from. Uh, so that should all be handled pretty easily. Uh, so let's take a look at what we've got now. Um, oh, push buffer, this used to actually be a call, I guess, which I don't know that we want it to be um, because that's sort of a different uh, situation. Where did we do here when we call push buffer? It pushes one of these. Uh, and this is, yeah. Uh, so this is like, we do push render element. Um, let's call that push render buffer. And then we'll call this push render buffer. All right, so in theory, we have hopefully broken nothing and everything works just fine now. Uh, and in theory, the only difference for the code, and again, I do need to test one other thing. When we actually change handmade internal to zero, we need to process bugs there, right? Um, and just see what's going on. It looks like we've got some other ones. Inline variables require at least but it's not an inline variable. So this must be like a debug ID is oh it's you know what I don't think it's called a, a debug ID anymore. It's called a deb ID. Uh, anyway just want to make sure that the non-internal build still works. Uh, Looks like some weird. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Not a member of game assets. See declaration of game assets. Ah, so you know what though? That is true. So all of this stuff, we really don't, all of this stuff where we, you know, parse incoming files. Uh, really not supposed to run anymore, right? Um, so basically this entire file is an if handmade internal, uh, right? Because we're not supposed to have any of that stuff. Uh, so I guess what I would say is that kind of needs to happen as well. Okay. I wonder what the bug is. Wow, we, we almost never have a four coder crash. That's a weird one. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to handmade hero again. Let me just see where that ended up uh, with where we were at. It may have actually saved the changes. There we go. All right, so looking at handmade internal here, what is this? Um, this is just placing things where it doesn't find a structural part. I may change that to an invalid code path for now. Let's see where we're at. So debug UI HUD, I guess that must be something that we forgot to define in both cases. Um, I'll take a look and see. Uh, so here is debug UI HUD, and I'm going to go ahead and guess that we just forgot to put it in here. Again, these are just making it so that we can compile out all of our sort of development code there. Uh, so here's a non-internal build. Uh, not sure what this is complaining about. So 
So somehow in this case, we don't have a font ID. Right, meaning that's came back as a non thing, right? Or no, I guess it didn't. So what's the problem here? It can't write to the UI font info. But why not? Hmm. So I'm not sure exactly what that's actually complaining about here because in theory, this looks like valid memory. And so it should be able to write to this pointer just fine. It's not writing through the pointer, right? It's gonna overwrite the pointer. So I'm not sure what that's actually complaining about. It looks more like an assertion. I wonder if it's an assertion that's actually somewhere else, maybe an inline code. It could be because of the get font info call Maybe this, this font ID value isn't quite right or something. Uh, let's take a look at that. So it's probably this, I would assume. Um, I don't actually know. So if we look at the defines for assert here, uh, handmade slow is actually the thing that determines it. So the asserts are all compiled in. And since there's a write directly to D word zero, that pretty much lets you know that, um, that pretty much tells us that, that this is the assertion. And it's probably the assertion that's saying that the thing that you received wasn't a font. But I have no idea how that could actually be possible or why it would change between the handmade internal version and the non-internal version. So that's a little bit confusing, right? Like, in other words, I'm not sure if there's some other bug we introduced there. Um, let's just double check to see what happens in internal mode. So internal mode works. Um, oops. Or does it? I didn't actually define it to zero there, but I guess maybe having nothing in it is the same. I don't know. There's internal mode. There's non internal mode. And here's the debug build. Um, and so I'm correct that it's uh, asserting that the type of this asset is not a font. And if we look at the HHA, you can see that it, it gave back basically a, like, I didn't find it, right? It's saying like it couldn't, it could not find uh, the one that, that's being discussed here. And the question is like, why couldn't it find it? You know what I mean? Uh, and I have no idea why. And so what I think we need to do there is we need to take a look and see whether or not that, oops, uh, whether or not there's something that we were doing that, that needs to happen, right, uh, in internal that is causing a problem for us, right? And there could be. So, I can't say I necessarily see why that would be the case um, because the asset loading still seems to be relatively the same. Um, but, you know, something's obviously different. We just don't know what. Again, nothing particularly compelling in most of these. They're pretty much what you would expect. You know, I don't, I don't see anything. It's, it's mostly just, you know, exactly what you would think. Hmm. 
Hmm. So what's going on there? Why is it having so much trouble with that? Um. <laughs> um. I would kind of like to know. I realize we're sort of off on a tangent here, but uh, the game should be able to run in both modes, and the fact that it can't is a bad sign. So we've got some lurking bug there uh, that we need to take care of. If I uh, go ahead and say handmade internal 1 and that does work, and handmade internal 0 doesn't work, and the place where we're stopping is in get font info because when we got the font, we couldn't find it. Um, the question is, what happened there? So I will say one thing, which is that Let me run that one more time. So if we go backwards here and we get the we do the like font ID equals get best match font from, right? I should be able to watch this fail uh, when we go through the asset system, you know, uh, and just see what's what's wrong, why it can't find it. And I'm guessing it's because there's no types. Yeah. So it's like the first asset of type for this type ID is not like loaded properly. And so I'm wondering like who is responsible for that being messed up. And again, that's sort of code we is scheduled for the chopping block, but it shouldn't be different between these two paths. So I would like to know what's going on there. Probably the set asset type got buried inside an internal block accidentally. Um, so looking here, let's just suppose a priori that was the case. Um, this would be where we would expect that. Yep. Oh wait, no, that's right there. So this is where this is happening. Is there something in here that we actually needed to have happen that's not happening? I wonder. So seeing as how it just uses global asset index, presumably as long as global asset index is correct, it should be okay, right? And so when we come through here, where do we set that and how is really all we kind of need to know. So you can see us just incrementing the asset counter here. We get the global asset index that way. That really shouldn't be dependent on this block. Hmm. Is there some part about us writing the tags out wrong that uh, like this is correcting for or something because again I don't see it like just looking at what's happening here there really isn't a lot of uh, reason to suspect that code of doing anything really relevant Hmm. So I guess I don't have any other ideas. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll just loosely step through this source path. 
And I'm going to step through it once the correct way and once the incorrect way and just see if I can spot anything obvious that it's doing differently. So in the asset system, I'm just going to set a breakpoint when we enter this part of the code. And I'm just going to see what's going on. So we're going to come through here. We're going to get the file asset counts out of this file. It says there's 169 of them. Uh, for good measure, I might as well look at what the file is. Um, I don't know if there's any. Okay, yeah. So the file stem is intro cutscene. And so if we're doing that, we just want to know like, okay, uh, intro cutscene has 169 things in it. So we start reading them uh, like so. In they come. We loop through each asset. The first global asset index for that case is one, which is what we would expect. Um, we're going to do some nonsense here that I don't feel like should be doing anything, but maybe is somehow. We're going to look at the type ID uh, and we're going to search the tags in this file. Um, well, actually that we loaded in, right? to see whether we can find one uh, that's the basic category. We're then going to set the asset type of that index to that, which we'll start to string it together. Um, and that's really it. So that's exactly what we would have expected to have happen. Um, if I go ahead and just jump here to where the fonts actually are coming from, it would have been base game, I believe. Uh, and they get found properly. Let me do that one more time. So here's base game. Um, right. It's got 478 assets in it. Let's see just real quick. What is the global asset index? And in this case, it's 170. Uh, and we're doing the rebasing here off of the file tag base. Does file tag base need to be? No, I don't think so. So there was no type ID for that one, whatever it was that came in there. A lot of things with no type ID, which seems bad. But I think those are actually okay, technically, because they're fonts. There's the font. And it's 275. So, all right. Let's do a recompile here. I'm going to set handmade internal to zero and just see if I can spot a difference. If not, we'll save it for tomorrow. Um, here's our file asset count and our first file. It looks the same, which is good. That's what we want to see. Um, we can sort of do a spot check here, you know, come through, get the first global asset index of one, uh, verify that it also creates a plate type, um, and it, it does. Uh, then we go into set asset type, right? Uh, and that all seems fine. So no real worries there. Uh, let's go ahead and run again. Oops. Did I not set a breakpoint? Oh. So we didn't load our other file. So the problem is actually that we just aren't loading the files. How did that happen? Let's try this again. So run to here. First file. 
intro cutscene. Looking at the header. That does not look correct. Although it could actually be correct. So we got a tie count of 227, asset count of 170. Right. Okay, so, so somehow we're not even looping over the correct number. Although actually, no, that's not true because it's zero is not counted. So we're just not. We're just not correctly adding the number of files somehow. So something's weird here. We got to step back for a second. So when we come through here, we're doing this nonsense, right? And for every file in the file group, we're creating one source file. So this is the issue, I guess, in its entirety. So hold on, let's see why. Here is me initializing two source files, and yet somehow that only results in two total files. Interesting. So what's going on there? Init source HHA. Oh my God. Seriously? Seriously? So where did we set that? Did you see that? So the reason is because we put in space for extra files. But this is wrong. That's lame. I feel like maybe this sets a mini owl of shame, sort of. So the problem there was just that, you know, we, we, we're maybe a little bit too, that should have just crashed or given us a hard error, but instead we kind of handle the error by saying, oh, well, I guess we're loading a file that's too many files, so we just won't load it and not mention it, <laughs> which is not great, right? Um, but I think that's our only problem, right? Was just that we didn't, you know, we, we had left room for a null file and then we didn't actually do anything with it. So there's the internal build or the non-internal build running we should be able to kick it back to regular optimized release builds and not have a problem now, I would assume. Um, yeah, so that was a waste of time, but hey, at least we now know the internal build works. So what I'd like to do tomorrow then, uh, and you can see now none of the debug stuff really works either. You can see that like, uh, you know, we can you can use the editor which I probably we should get rid of at some point, uh, but like none of the profile or any of that stuff is because that's all compiled out. We should probably compile out the editor too. Um, all right. So let's save everything for tomorrow. I'd like to go ahead and visualize that memory tomorrow now that we have the ability to record it uh, coming through. And this seems pretty clean, so now I'm happy to turn this back on. I assume we can also turn slow off. That's all good. All right, so I think we're good. Um, let's go ahead and set this back to a normal state and we'll do a brief Q and A.
Let's see. Any questions about what we were doing? On topic questions, please. Why do you delete the PDBs before each build? Have you found the compiler having issues or leaving junk if you just let the compiler do it? Uh, so the reason that the build has to delete the PDBs is because we create a new PDB every time. Um, so in a normal build environment where you don't use live code reloading, uh, you would normally just generate a PDB to a file that is the same file every time you build. So you don't get a problem with PDBs like stacking up and getting an infinite number of PDBs in your build directory, right? But because we use live code reloading and Visual Studio, um, and in fact, probably most debuggers don't read the PDB and then unlock it, you end up with a situation where you cannot replace the existing PDB file because the game is running. So what we had to do really early on in Handmade Hero because we support hot code reloading, like without closing the game, the code will reload when you make changes. Um, we had to create random names for our PDB files. So instead of writing a PDB to the same name every time, we pick a random number and write the PDB to that, right? Then, we link that random PDB with the random name for the DLL to create a new DLL that isn't going to clash, you know, with our existing one, right? Um, and so we do this kind of fancy dance to allow hot to allow hot code reloading to work, but really they're just deficiencies of the coding environment. It's because Visual Studio is crappy would be another way to to say it. Um, yet another way to say it is to say that it's because Windows is crappy, because their system doesn't support inode-like file manipulation like, for example, Linux does. So as a result, the default way you interact with files, unless you go through extraordinary lengths and use volume shadow copy service and all this other garbage, can't do stuff like replace this file even though someone's using it and make the next person who goes to use it get the new file. Like, doesn't work, right? Um, and so, yeah, you just fundamentally find yourself in a position where you have to work around those things. And that's why we delete the PDBs is because otherwise they would just stack up forever because we're creating a new one, completely new name every time. In that system, do you have to transform all push functions into macros. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by in that system, but generally speaking, if you want to push things onto memory and track what file and line number they are, you do have to do that, right? Lucid Frost, what are some better alternatives to things like if defs that a language could provide? Well, in our case, it's fairly obvious, right? If you were designing a language and had a clue, you would just include the ability for someone to say, get me the file and line number of the person who called me. Done. So all functions that allocate in memory need to become macros if you want to keep track of where the memory is allocated. Yes, correct. How much more stable has Remedy gotten since you started using it on stream? Were there any particularly big issues that caused you trouble that have been fixed in that time? Uh, yeah, actually, there's been tons of revisions to Remedy um, that made it more stable since we started. Uh, what I would say is, you I mean, you see me using it every day on stream now. Have you seen any issues? I, I just don't run into them anymore. It seems very stable. Uh, I really haven't had any issues. There's some features I'd like to see, obviously, but, you know, as a, as a replacement for Visual Studio now, it's just fine.
Do you think unit using do you think using tests would have made it easier to find the code paths that were broken with this refactor? Refactor? What refactor? First of all, we have not refactored anything. I don't really like that name either because it doesn't refer to anything in specifically, right? Um, it just is a term that means programming. But uh, I'm not sure what tests we would have had in this case, right? I mean, first of all, no code did break with the changes we made. Uh, all the code worked exactly correctly. The thing that actually was wrong was just a thing that with handmade internal setting to zero, we had not tested that code path in forever. So there was just a one bug with asset loading that we introduced long ago, like many, many weeks ago, right? And would, would it tests have fixed that? No, I mean, we found it quite quickly actually. So even, I can't even think of a test that would have caught that error that could have been written in less than the 15 minutes it took to find it, right? So I guess one way to say it would be, no, tests would have been a complete waste of time. Is that why you put all push functions in the same file? Uh, no, I think I put them all in the same file just because they all have to do with memory, probably. Um, I don't think I put them in there because I was thinking ahead. Um, I just put them in there because that's where they go, right? The calls that have to do with putting memory into an arena should kind of all be in one file so that I can just see what puts memory on an arena. Here it is, right? If you didn't do code reloading, say for release, would you still have the platform XC and a separate deal for the game code? Uh, no, I don't think there'd be any reason to do that. Um, you could still do it just because there's no real reason why you couldn't. Like you don't necessarily get any benefits from welding the code together in any particular way uh, because those boundaries are pretty low frequency. So you don't really need to take advantage of any kind of like linker optimization or something like that that would happen there but uh there's certainly no reason not to do it and for really all intents and purposes maybe we will have a way to build just a single exe version just for fun i mean we might do that you know so i guess i don't know um but what i would say is it's purely an arbitrary distinction that's there in our case for no reason other than to support the code reloading. So we don't need, a, we don't need separate DLLs for any particular reason. The renderer, on the other hand, we have as a separate DLL uh, for, for a good reason. And the reason for that is we may want to allow people to replace the renderer DLL without uh, replacing anything else in the game. If someone just wanted to someday cook up a like ray tracing renderer for Handmade Hero, uh, it'd be great if they could just post a DLL that's like, hey, here's a ray trace renderer, go nuts. And it just drops in and works, right? So having the renderer be extendable in that way where you can just sort of drop in a new renderer and make it work. Um, so The color location is a many to one mapping, which is why languages generally don't do it. You could, but it means complications for the runtime code generation. Uh, nope, it, it really doesn't, right? Uh, and the reason that I say that is because if you look at what I just did, that is what the compiler had to do. So anything I can just do by making a macro is something the compiler could have just done. So it really doesn't, right? It's like, that is not a complication that is onerous um, if your compiler is any good at all. It's really basic. It's just saying, um, I, in fact, a template is the same way, right? C++ compilers already have to deal with templates, which essentially say generate a different version of this code path based on what the, declar the declaration of the person doing this thing does at the call site. Um, and they've got that. So I know they could do it. They just choose to not support features like that uh, because they don't know what they're doing, right? Um, they, they basically, almost all complicated languages actually do the work of doing things like this and then are so short-sighted in the way they design things that they don't actually allow you to use them in useful ways. 
In fact, you could argue that the entire design of C++ has been one giant exercise in making massive complexity in the compiler that actually yields you no practical benefit to the programmer. It's kind of remarkable, actually, how complex a C++ compiler is for how little it offers you. All right, we're done with questions. All right, thank you everyone for joining me for an episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure recording with you as always. If you would like to follow along the series, uh, you can always do so at handmadehero.org. If you pre-order the source code, I'm uh, sorry, if you pre-order the game, you can get the source code any day you want. I update it after we stream. Uh, and so you can follow along at home and play around with it. Um, for example, uh, some of the things that we talked about, if you want to try and beat me to it, uh, you've got all day today to go try to put some memory visualization into the system, uh, maybe you should give it a shot. It's good practice uh, to always try to do something that I say I'm gonna do before I do it, um, because then you can see what it feels like to try and have to do it without already having seen someone do it uh, in a particular way. And who knows, you may come up with something better than what I'm gonna come up with, which is even, which is even more cool, right? So uh, that's about it for today. I'll be back here for tomorrow. Uh, we'll be at the normal time tomorrow, which is uh, at noon. Uh, today was an early one at 10. Uh, we'll be at normal time tomorrow. So I hope to see everyone back here for that when we'll put the memory visualization in and then we can move on to uh, working on the ground cover stuff. I just want to have the memory visualization there so I can demonstrate the difference when I change things like those entity structs, how much memory is being used and so on. And it's kind of hard to get a feel for that right now. Uh, it's just something that we'd like to be able to look at. Uh, that's it for today. Hope to see everyone back here tomorrow. Till then, have fun programming. I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.